hear me. One more try. Good afternoon. My name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education at the National First Ladies Library, located at the National First Ladies site in Canton, Ohio. The site is currently open to the public and has new hours for fall, Thursday through Saturday. And there are three really amazing exhibitions here that you will want to stop by to see if you're in the area. One about the First Lady's first 100 days, another about the McKinley's wedding, and a third is about um, uh, the fashion designer of Jackie Kennedy's wedding dress, Anne Lowe. So those are up through the holidays and the new year. We are still really excited about them and um, really excited for you to come and see them. So please check those out. Before we get started with today's talk, I want to remind you about some upcoming programs, but also some housekeeping issues related to Zoom. So I know that many of you are seasoned Zoomers, but if you are new to the Zoom format, we are using the question and answer at the bottom of your Zoom to um, give questions to our speaker today. Um, we also have the chat open, so if you have any um, technical questions for me as you're listening, um, any um, info that you want about the site, we will link in that chat to Eventbrite to register for future programs with the National First Ladies Library, um, as well as some books um, related to upcoming talks and other things. I also rec wanna recommend anyone who has logged in through Eventbrite to watch the program. We've had many visitors complain about being unable to hear the program through Eventbrite. So there is a way you can click out to Zoom to log into Zoom um, through the Eventbrite portal. And we recommend viewing that way. So those are all the housekeeping things related to our Zooming today. And again, if you have any issues, please reach out to me through the chat and I'm happy to help troubleshoot with my um, rudimentary technology skills here. Um, but I also wanna mention some upcoming programs. Believe it or not, it is November and the holidays are right around the corner and holiday season is always the very um, most fun celebration for us at the National First Ladies Library because there are so many amazing things that First Ladies have done to celebrate the holidays. Um, and we are really excited about next month's Legacy Lecture. We will have Colleen Christian Burke, who is the author of the book Christmas with the First Ladies. She will be with us for a virtual legacy lecture on December 1st at noon. She will be speaking about holiday joy at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue um, and later time period than we're going to talk about today, but she's going to talk about the White House decorations. Um, things start rolling pretty early, as early as um, post inauguration for decorating the White House. So she will be able to talk to us about the current first lady and decor. And we'll also go all the way back to Jackie Kennedy um, and take us on a journey through all of the more current first ladies. Um, she is also going to be doing a first ladies night craft activity with us um, the following week. So all of those events are accessible through our Eventbrite. You can sign up for them. Um, we also have several children's programs related to the holiday. Our Fun with Flotus Live in November is Pardon That Turkey. We're going to be doing our annual turkey pardoning as a virtual event. Um, it is a really fun interactive program. And we have a holiday program for children as well coming up. We are going to be doing several really cool activities. Um, and we are super excited for that. But now to today's talk, um, the only other thing I want to mention about upcoming programs related to today's talk is if you haven't joined our book club book, um, book club group, we have a number of really fun interactive programs as well, a film discussion and a book club discussion group. And we are going to be reading uh, first, the lady first, the world of First Lady Sarah Polk um, by today's speaker, Amy Greenberg. So that is November 22nd, and it is a riveting book. You have plenty of time to read it um, if you get sucked into this talk 
today, which I know you will, please sign up and join us for um, the book discussion. It is a really great discussion group. We read fiction and non related to first ladies and women in politics um, and women's history. So it is a great group um, and we hope that you will join us for that. So on to today's event, I'm going to introduce today's speaker and turn things over to her. Dr. Amy S. Greenberg is the George Winfrey Professor of History and Women's Studies at Penn State University. A leading scholar of history of 19th century America, she's held fellowships from the Guggenheim F Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the American Philosophical Society, among others. She's published five books, including A Narrative History of the U.S.-Mexican War, an investigation into the role of the ideology of manifest, a manifest destiny played in both foreign affairs and American society at home, and a study of the relationship between gender, culture, and urbanization. She is here today to talk about her book, Lady First, The World of First Lady Sarah Polk. So Amy Greenberg, I am excited to turn things over to you. Allison, thank you so much. Um, it's an honor to be delivering this month's legacy lecture, and I wish I could be there in person in Canton, Ohio, to see those wonderful displays, even though I understand most of you are not actually in Canton right now. Um, but I'm here with you uh, virtually. So I'm going to share my screen. All right, as Allison mentioned, I'm here to talk to you all about Sarah Polk. Um, now, many of you who love First Ladies probably don't know a lot about Sarah Polk. And uh, my job as I see it today is to explain why you need to know more about her um, and let you know how she became the 19th century's most powerful First Lady. Even though you've never heard about her, because, as the title of my book suggests, she considered herself a lady first, above being a public persona or a powerful figure. She believed herself to be a lady and all that entailed. So I want to tell you about Sarah Polk, uh, the role that she played in the foreign policy of her husband, James K. Polk, and finally make some suggestions about why she was able to um, accrue and exercise power in a period when women had no rights uh, and they were expected to be submissive. Okay, so here is a picture of Sarah. I'll give you a, another one here. This is the first picture that we have of Sarah. Um, she was born Sarah Childress in 1803 in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And were it not for her marriage to James K. Polk when she was 20 and he was 28, no one would know her name. She would fade into obscurity like all the 19th century women whose identities were subsumed into their husbands upon marriage and who divided their, devoted their lives to their families. Now, according to rumor, it was Andrew Jackson who encouraged James Polk, then a young state legislator, to court the teenage Sarah Childress. Polk had gone to school with Sarah's brother and had met and admired her. And James K. Polk followed Jackson's advice in this as in everything else. And the couple married at her parents' plantation near Murfreesboro, Tennessee in 1824. Sarah hailed from a background very much like James's background. The Childresses and the Polks were slave-owning Presbyterians at the very pinnacle of Tennessee society. Sarah's father was a wealthy land speculator who recognized and encouraged his oldest daughter's unusual intelligence. Sarah attended the exclusive Moravian Female Academy in North Carolina, which was the very best school open to women um, in the South, and some would argue the best school open to women in the entire country. And like her future husband, she excelled academically. And at the time when Sarah went to the Moravian Female Academy, uh, very, very few women attended what you would then describe as high school. Um, and the curriculum at the Moravian Female Academy was almost exactly the same as the curriculum that James studied at what would become the University of North Carolina, with the exception of the fact that the men at UNC studied Latin and Greek and um, women at the Female Academy 
studied needlework um, and piano, but other than that, the curriculum was the same. They both studied natural philosophy, mathematics, um, the same literature. Um, so it was a very good education. Now, after her marriage, um, Sarah and James and the slaves that she inherited from her father, she inherited 10 slaves. This is a major part of her dowry and one reason why she was an attractive marriage partner. They moved into a small cottage um, on the property of uh, James's parents. Sarah's mother-in-law did all the entertaining, which freed Sarah from a great deal of the normal responsibilities of a young wife first assuming control of the household. Now in the normal course of events, Sarah would have been busy with the demands of motherhood, but because James underwent experimental surgery for bladder stones as a teenager, he was left unable to father a child. Now, what I would love to know is if James was aware that he would never be able to bear children. And if he spoke to Sarah about this before they got married, but we don't know this. What we do know is that when it became apparent that Sarah wasn't going to become a mother, um, she embraced James's political world um, in a very, very unusual uh, manner and, part, and became part of the reason that she became so powerful. Now, Sarah Childress Polk was in many ways a conventional antebellum Southern lady. She venerated her husband above all other men. She spent far too much money on clothes, hats, and shoes. And she believed in her heart that um, God intended black men and women to live their lives in slavery. So she had a very hierarchical, strict, religious view of the world that was very much in keeping with her time and place. Um, she believed that hierarchy was predestined, white above black, men above women, um, at the same time that more evangelical sects like um, uh, the Methodists uh, and the Baptists uh, began to preach that um, equality of all men and women um, was not only possible, but true in God's eyes, and that um, anybody could uh, receive God's grace um, if they wanted to. But as a slaveholding Calvinist Presbyterian, Sarah knew that having power meant the difference between life and death, and that God intended the powerful to guide the weak with a firm hand. Um, and as a slaveholder and a woman, she was able to understand this dynamic in a particularly nuanced manner, and to appreciate the value of power more than some other people. But in other ways, Sarah was decidedly atypical. She was childless in an era when childbearing and rearing defined a woman's life. And even before she got married, she delighted in party politics, not just the legislation and principles that impacted the life of all Americans and inspired fierce partisanship by both the Democratic Party and the opposition party, which was called the Whigs, but also the practice of party politics, the campaigning, gossip, coalition building, and elections that consume the vast majority of a candidate's time. And yesterday was election day, and I was thinking about this a lot um, while I was working the polls, how um, this is a real part of American history is, is um, the excitement of elections. And even when women couldn't vote, that excitement was open to everybody. Um, this idea that democracy can be um, renewed at every election and that, that it's all in our hands by casting a vote. Women couldn't cast a vote, but um, they could participate in that celebration um, nonetheless. So Sarah's um, enjoyment of politics and her engagement with it, it came naturally. Her father and her brother were both very political people, and they shared that passion with her. The first two decades of Sarah's life coincided with um, the, a vast expansion of voting in America and the simultaneous creation of party politics. Um, as average Americans came to realize that politics could be a means of power, especially on the slaveholding frontier, where state legislation could bestow immense profits um, or sentence a person to complete failure. So Sarah, um, was the perfect partner to James. And as the years passed, they forged a union of incredible strength. And, and if you read Lady First, um, you will read about a, a really, really 
remarkably loving um, marriage. Um, they really were everything to each other. Sarah fulfilled all the normal expectations for political wives. She was social. Um, James was not social. And she was very solicitous of his health, which was never good. Sarah fought a valiant effort to get James to eat and sleep on a regular basis. Um, he was sort of a workaholic and didn't eat very well. But that said, theirs was far from a typical 19th century marriage. And let me actually just say about this image, this was taken um, in the Polk White House um, near the end of the presidency. Uh, the main characteristic that set the folk marriage apart from other marriages in the period was that they were childless. And this was an era when the birth and upbringing of children absolutely defined a woman's married life. Uh, and Sarah, you know, who was political to begin with and had no children, she threw herself into her husband's work. And, and this is very important. James was not threatened by Sarah's political abilities. In fact, he embraced her political abilities and this sets their marriage apart as well. When you look at a lot of the presidential marriages in the 19th century, what you find is men, presidents who don't fully appreciate their wives' political opinions. And this was absolutely not the case for the Polks. James not only appreciated Sarah's political opinions and her political abilities, he pushed her to be more and more political and to really work as his right-hand woman. Now, early in their marriage, when Sarah would try and get James to stop working and come to bed, he put her to work. Taking up a newspaper, he would tell her, this is something that she said herself, Sarah, here's something I want you to read and then tell me what the contents of this are. So soon she was analyzing political debates for James uh, and he also invited her to travel with him. Um, she was one of the only wives who traveled regularly with their politician husbands. She recalled, he always wished me to go and he'd say, um, why would you stay at home to take care of the house? If the house burns down, we can live without it. So whether James's primary goal was preventing his wife from becoming lonely in their childless house or whether he needed her help, um, Sarah became James's closest political advisor. And, and this suited her fine. Um, one of her friends remarked that, quote, knowing much of the political affairs Knowing much of political affairs, Sarah found pleasure in the society of gentlemen. And rather than socializing with other wives, whenever possible, Sarah could be found with men. She was, quote, always in the parlor with Mr. Polk. Now, Sarah, um, James's party was the Democratic Party. And Sarah was just as Democratic as he was. And of the two, the more ambitious. James used to joke that had he remained a clerk in the legislature of Tennessee, Sarah never would have married him, but he probably wasn't far from the mark. Before they got married, Sarah extracted a promise that James would run for Congress, and he did soon after their marriage. Um, and Sarah spent a year apart from him because it wasn't normal for congressmen to bring their, bring their wives with them to Washington. But the year that they spent apart was so excruciating that um, the second year of his first term in, in Congress, um, Sarah went with him uh, to Washington. Um, let me show you a picture here. Oh, it, here's an image of what women's lives were supposed to be like in the 19th century. Um, we call this the domestic sphere. The idea in the 19th century was that men and women lived in separate spheres, that men were in the political world and women were in the home world. But as you can see from this idealized image of um, the women's world, it really centered around children. So Sarah joined the men's world instead. When Sarah and James went together to Washington in the 1820s, 
they moved into a boarding house. And boarding houses were where congressmen lived in the 19th century. The congressional terms were too short and the pay too low for congressmen to actually have their own homes in Washington, DC. So they lived in boarding houses where a man would have his own room and he would eat common meals together with the rest of the boarding house residents um, in a dining room. And there weren't a lot of women who lived in boarding houses and there were no children who lived in boarding houses. So it was totally inappropriate for children. But Sarah went um, and she and James moved into a nice boarding house. And she turned the boarding house into what we can call a political salon. So one of the ways that she was able to become powerful was she recognized the opportunities that living in a boarding house um, offered her as a Washington woman. So she and James had a bedroom together, but they took um, extra rooms that they used strictly for entertaining. Um, and this sort of um, continued a tradition that she had started in her mother-in-law's house, which is that she wasn't in charge of cooking. Um, she kind of uh, let the boarding house owner take care of the normal responsibilities of home ownership, and she just focused on political entertaining. Um, now to understand Sarah's rise to power, you have to understand the practice of politics in Washington, DC during the age of Andrew Jackson. Um, Washington had a population of 18,000 people in 1830, but the political class was much smaller. It was in effect a small town that really ran on gossip. Men exchanged rumors about personal and political indiscretions, about secret alliances, about courtship and economic failures. Um, I'm sorry, but men exchange rumors about personal and political indiscretions and secret alliances and political fortunes, while women exchange rumors about all those things um, and economic fortunes. Gossip became a fixture of national politics during the first Congress uh, when the absence of established parties increased the power of political reputation to a man's success. By the 1820s, Washington's men and women gossip constantly but separately, women with women and men with men. And talk of this sort, like we tend to think gossip is bad now, but gossip did a lot in the early 19th century. It could have a transformative impact on a man's political career or even the fate of an entire presidential candidate. Sarah was the first political wife to successfully bridge the gap between male and female gossip. She was equally comfortable in both worlds and discovered that men were willing to tell her things that they might not tell other men and that wives were the best source of news about husbands and the men that they entertained. Sarah's facility um, in the realm of political entertaining was of crucial importance to buttressing James's position. She said the terms upon which Polk formed alliances and influenced other people. Her access to news and skill deploying it drew men to her. Now she was by no means a beautiful woman. This is her, uh, a portrait painted when she was um, first in the White House. Uh, Sarah was very self-conscious about her bad teeth. Um, she kept her mouth closed all the time. And she had an overly prominent nose. But in addition to really shiny black hair and bright eyes um, and a you know, very kind of um, nice figure, she radiated intelligence and charm and even when she was surrounded by more conventionally beautiful women, um, she, her self-possession and her, she was always beautifully dressed. It made her stand out in any room. And you can see this in comments uh, from both men and women who encountered her. Men often attributed her good looks to her childlessness. I think that's interesting. Um, they said that she looked young and maybe that was because she was childless. Um, and as an older woman, she was described as exceptionally handsome and remarkably well-preserved. Now, by all accounts, um, even James's political enemies described Sarah as a wonderful conversationalist with excellent manners and a clear eagerness to please. 
and this was part of her um, her appeal. She was just great at listening um, and just a pleasure to talk to. Um, you know, there were a lot of women that were fond of her, but her closest relationships throughout her life were all with men, with her father, um, with her brother, John, um, and then a lot of James's political colleagues in Tennessee. And one thing I think is really interesting is these men who she was very close to, none of them could be considered enlightened on the matter of gender relations. So again, if you were to ask each of these men individually whether they thought men were generally more intelligent or um, better politicians or you know, more, in, you know, more entitled to political opinions than, than women were, they would all say yes, but they would say Sarah was different. So the one thing that really blew me away about Sarah when I started researching her is the fact that these men, these very traditional men, treated Sarah like an equal. They didn't talk down to her. They didn't patronize her. They wrote letters to her without any condensation about political matters. So they treated her like a political equal, despite the fact that they thought, in general, women were not um, political equals. So Sarah was able to stand apart, and I'm going to be able to tell you why that is in a little bit. Now, above everybody else, her closest relationship, as I mentioned, was with James, and they were a remarkably successful political team. Now, we don't have a lot of correspondence between James and Sarah Polk because they were so often together. Um, so they spent almost no time apart in the entire course of their marriage. Now, what correspondence that has survived between the two of them shows that Sarah felt comfortable advising James on politics and tactics. She warned him against running for a short session in the Senate. She told him which political editors weren't to be trusted and he almost never ignored her advice. Now, one thing that's really interesting about Sarah is James was hardly the only politician who turned to Sarah for advice. Congressmen, senators, and even a justice of the Supreme Court sought Sarah's opinion on political matters and depended on her for the inside information that enabled the successful navigation of the Washington political scene. One um, close friend of James's and close friend of hers, I should say, wrote to ask if votes in a certain county were quote, amiss noting that no one is likely to know as well as you. So this is a politician who is asking Sarah what votes are looking like in a particular county, not because she had access to James, but because she would know it herself. Now, Sarah remained in Washington with James for 13 years, um, with the exception of one congressional term when uh, a social event in the Andrew Jackson cabinet, the Andrew Jackson cabinet um, tore the cabinet apart. That's called the Peggy Eaton affair. And I can tell you about it in the Q&A session if you want. Uh, but in any case, Sarah basically had to leave Washington, um, but then came back. And other than that, she was by his side. Um, with Jackson's support, James became Speaker of the House of Representatives in 1835. And James is, here's a picture of James as Speaker of the House. Um, her husband's position provided Sarah with new authority among the wives of Washington's most powerful men. And in 1839, James decided to leave Washington and return to Tennessee and run for the governor's office. Um, Sarah was not necessarily in support of this plan. She really liked Washington, D.C., uh, but James had to do it to help the party. And when James left Washington, um, a Supreme Court justice wrote Sarah a poem praising her playful mind, um, and it's a lovely poem. Now, in the months that followed the exit of the Polks from Washington, Sarah received letters from politicians indicating her power. Uh, one politician bemoaned her absence from a city where, quote, a woman can learn more than a man, greatly more, saying, you have access to information I don't. And, um, you know, over a decade of political service to James in Washington, um, often 
struggling to meet his demands for political news, he would say to her, Sarah, go see if you can find out information about what this or that congressman is planning on voting on, um, you know, left her in this kind of uh, very powerful political um, uh, status. Now, uh, so James and Sarah go back to uh, Tennessee. James became the governor. Um, Sarah was more of a success as uh, Tennessee's first lady than James was as governor. He was defeated for re-election twice. Uh, and during that time period, he campaigned extensively. And this is a period, the biggest period when they're separated, when we have letters between them. And the letters between the two of them re to reveal how dependent he was on Sarah for political information. At one point he wrote her, you must send me news. Um, asking her to lobby editors and politicians. And her ability, inability to live up to his expectations pained her. She once replied with exasperation to James's demand that he uh, you know, talk to some newspaper editors and see where they stood on his political positions. She said, um, I'm unable to learn anything with a house full of guests. I trust you won't hold it against me that the housework is neglected. So they had a rather playful relationship when it came to conventional gender roles. He didn't care that she ignored domestic matters as long as she continued to provide him with the political information that he needed. You know, unfortunately, while they were separated, Sarah became very depressed, um, so depressed that James adjusted his behavior and they were never again separated for more than a week. Now in 1844, um, James was out of work. He had run for governor for re-election twice and had lost. And they were living in Tennessee and he was focusing um, on running a cotton plantation uh, to make money. But that year, 1844, President John Tyler attempted to annex Texas. And the two front runners for that nomination, Henry Clay and Martin Van Buren, uh, both opposed Texas nomination, Texas annexation, arguing that it would lead to war with Mexico and exacerbate sectional tensions. Um, but Polk uh, was a big believer in both Texas annexation and manifest destiny, the idea that the US should expand across the continent. Both his family and Sarah's family grew rich, speculating on land which had been taken from Indians um, and growing cotton there. So he saw this as the ideal for growth for America, move across the country, take land from Indians and Mexicans, and um, you know, that's the idea of America that they had in their mind. So what James did is he issued a letter in favor of Texas annexation, and he managed to gain uh, the nomination of the Democratic Party. He was the first uh, dark horse candidate because he was unexpected um, as a candidate, but be, the Democratic Party wanted someone who supported um, annexing Texas. So he became the candidate. Uh, here's a national badge for the Democratic Party, um, Polk, Dallas, um, in favor of Texas and no bank. Um, so uh, James began to run for president. Now in a way running for president was easier than running for governor because uh, in order to run for governor, he had to travel all around the state, but presidential candidates were not expected to campaign um, for themselves. So they were basically able to stay together. And James put Sarah in charge of coordinating his campaign. Um, now when actually when Polk was first nominated, one advisor encouraged him to put Sarah to work, saying James might lack the time or tact to conciliate or please, but Sarah could. Um, quote, the wife of a man aspiring to the White House is no minor circumstance. Mrs. Polk should be visited by Whigs and Democrats of her own sex, as the ladies of the other side uniformly speak well and highly of her. So even Polk's allies recognized that Polk's kind of prickly personality required management. Uh, and Sarah became a major um, advantage in the political campaign. Uh, Polk was elected president in 1844, in large part because of stance on Texas, but Sarah's reputation 
her piousness also played a role in the campaign. I should tell you that she was um, very religious. Uh, she didn't drink alcohol. She didn't believe in gambling. She didn't attend horse races. Um, and this very traditional religious outlook uh, was very much in keeping with the values that a lot of Americans had, but wasn't normal for presidential spouses in the time period. If you look at the first ladies um, that came before Sarah, um, most of them uh, were happy to go to the theater, to dance, to throw parties, to drink alcohol. Um, DC was uh, kind of more of a sophisticated and freewheeling place than other places in America. So Sarah's kind of traditional image uh, really worked for her. Now, some of the opposition party who were really disappointed that James won the presidency, hoped that Sarah would have a positive influence on his administration. One um, politician's wife, Sarah Preston Hale of Massachusetts, uh, who was 48 years old and a big supporter of Polk's opponent, Henry Clay, wrote that quote, she wondered if perhaps Mr. and Mrs. Polk together will make a very good president. Now the two headed to Washington and they set up a shared office in the domestic quarters of the White House. James left her piles of newspapers each evening to digest and Sarah's job was to work through them and leave markers on the articles that she wanted James uh, to read. So she controlled his access to news. They regularly put in 12 to 14 hours of work in a day. Polk admitted near the end of his life, quote, none but Sarah knew so intimately my affairs. But even at the height of his powers, President Polk was open about the degree to which he and his wife worked as a team. Typical was his comment when Sarah broke up an impromptu concert given by Democrats in his honor on the Sabbath, which they were opposed to doing anything on the Sabbath but going to church. He said, Sarah directs all domestic affairs and she believes this is domestic. Now the hopes of Sarah's constituents are documented in the many letters that they wrote to her upon James's election. These reveal both the normal expectations for women of the era and the power of the domestic ideal of the time. Her supporters expected her to be a model of religious propriety and to guide her husband's behavior by setting a moral example. Now, James and Sarah's relationship bore little resemblance to what the public imagined. Not only were they political partners, but James generally set the moral example for Sarah, who, while beneficent and very pious in public, was very judgmental and private and actually shared a lot of hurtful gossip. So James actually, um, would hear Sarah gossiping, would say, you know, don't talk that way about people, Sarah, it's not right. Well, they're both pretty morally upright people. Now, Sarah was 42 when James became president. And here we have um, kind of the, I don't know. I So Courier and Ives were the main printmakers of this time period. And this is the Courier and Ives portrait of, um, actually James Courier portrait of Sarah. And, and I love this image of her because um, she, it kind of captures how serious she is um, without idealizing her. So she's wrapped in this kind of interesting garment that almost makes like a flag. Uh, she's just staring straight ahead. She isn't smiling. She look, you know, she looks like a, a, a kind of reliable, serious and important presence. And that's really what she was. Uh, so when Sarah became first lady, basically everybody left her. No one had forgotten her. You know, she had spent all that time in Washington when James was in Congress and when he was Speaker of the House. Uh, and in, for, as first lady, her power and influence grew with the guidance of her mentor, Dolly Madison, who was still around in Washington and who pioneered the art of mixing politics with uh, parties. Sarah learned how to employ domestic skills, which were never her strong suit in the service of the political. Um, but Sarah took a lot of liberties Dolly would never have taken. Dolly gossiped with women, but Sarah gossiped directly with men. 
So although Sarah's religious piety required that she shun, quote, the follies and amusements of the world, and she banned hard liquor, dancing, and card playing from the White House, she managed to pull off entertaining executive dinners in which gracious hospitality shamelessly combined with ceaseless lobbying. Dressed in simple and meticulously tailored gowns of dark hued velvets and satins, Sarah cultivated a restrained elegance in keeping with her democratic ethos. She held two regular evening receptions every week and added a third on Saturday when Congress was in session. And when James was unable to attend these um, receptions, she hosted them alone. Powerful men cultivated her goodwill. More than one leading politician openly declared he would rather discuss the issues of the day with her than with her husband. Um, one way that Sarah was able to focus on politics, which I think is very clever, is that the main time sink for political women in the first half of the 19th century was returning social calls. So what, what would happen would be a woman would go and she would leave a card at somebody's house when they weren't there, and then it would be the responsibility of that woman to return the card. And first ladies were really inundated um, and oppressed by this need to return calls. And Sarah did something really amazing, which is that she invited her nieces to come stay with her in the White House, and then she forced them to return the calls that other Washington ladies made on her so she freed herself from the main time sink of most political wives and instead she stayed by James's side and she stopped people from coming into his office who she didn't think should be talking to him. Um, she met with men uh, individually in the White House and she just ignored this whole political aspect all together. Um, at, by the time that James declared war on Mexico and started the war against the U uh, against Mexico in 1846 that would bring um, half of Mexico's territory into the US, including California. Uh, Sarah controlled physical access to James and served as his private secretary. Um, just a brief thing about the war with Mexico. This is the key accomplishment of the Polk administration was taking all of the land that became California and Colorado and Arizona and Nevada and Texas and New Mexico from Mexico. And when you read my book, you can see the extent to which Sarah's correspondence um, with other politicians helped um, enable this. Um, she also uh, did a lot to cultivate support for this war among um, members of Congress of both parties. Uh, and she was a real believer in this war as much as her husband was. Okay. Now, I just want to show you an image of a presidential reception to help you understand um, the kind of events that Sarah threw during the US-Mexico War. She made sure that there were always veterans, um, preferably injured veterans on display at, um, in these receptions, and she would have toasts to the US-Mexico War. Um, and when you read James's diary, you can see that during the war, he is sort of out of touch with what the public thinks about it. And I think that that's because Sarah is controlling access to him and editing his news intakes to limit his exposure to kind of the increasingly vindictive attacks on him for a war that went on longer than most Americans would like and that resulted in a lot more deaths than he would like. All right, so I've explained how Sarah accumulated and exercised power. One thing that's interesting is how the press negotiated this. So Sarah is a political woman in a period when women are not supposed to be political. This is what the doctrine of separate spheres says. So how does the press deal with this? So basically what the press does is they report on how political Sarah is but they explain or justify her behavior by suggesting that she's doing everything in the interest of her husband. 
So Sarah is very successful at cultivating an image of subservience and democratic equality that's actually really at odds with reality. Whenever Sarah um, reported an opinion with somebody other than her husband or a close friend, she would say, well, the president thinks this or the president thinks that. So she represented herself as a conduit to her husband as, a, um, as having no opinions of her own, but simply being one part of her husband. And that enabled her to actually be very political. Like no one was threatened by her because they believed this pretense that she made of being utterly subservient um, to her husband. And we know that this wasn't true because we can see the correspondence between the two of them, but this enabled people to allow her to not be like other women. So she became this, um, even though her image was of this pious wife, in reality, she was this very powerful person. So she used this idea of subservience to actually amass and exercise uh, power. Um, she staged media events, which highlighted her public charity and her thrift and her decency and her um, piety. Uh, but in fact, she was very powerful, not just in political matters, but during her husband's presidency, she, she surreptitiously bought and sold slaves for their Mississippi cotton plantation, providing her husband with plausible deniability about um, uh, purchasing and selling slaves, which was, even though slavery was legal, presidents were not supposed to um, be buying or selling slaves. They weren't supposed to be actively involved in slavery, especially not. Um, explicitly to make money, which is what actually the Polks were trying to do with their um, plantation. Sarah did a lot of other amusing things. Um, she announced that she would not be redecorating the White House because she wanted to save money, but in fact, she just wasn't interested in redecorating the White House. Uh, the public kind of embraced her for her thrift, but in fact, she just um, didn't, that wasn't where her interests were. She wore these very simple and beautiful clothing, but she spent outrageous sums of money on them. So uh, kind of in keeping with the idea that the simplest clothes are the most um, expensive to make look good. Um, in the summer of 1847, she spent the equivalent of $13,000 on one order of dresses from Paris. Um, so, and I'm sorry, here's a picture of what we could call the White House family. The Polk White House was the first White House where um, there was photography. So, um, daguerreotypes were invented in the 1840s and Sarah invited a daguerreotype artist into the house, um, the White House to take pictures. And there's Sarah and James in the middle of the photo surrounded by various important people um, directly to next to James is Dolly Madison, who's looking a little blurry. And next to Sarah are two of the nieces who I told you um, she made work for her and made return calls that she didn't want to return. You know, historians previously who had written about the Polk presidency, they assumed that James and Sarah were sad to be childless because they always had nieces staying with them, but they didn't recognize that Sarah was putting the nieces to work. Um, I kind of concluded in the course of my reading and my research that Sarah and James didn't actually, they were happy. I don't want to say they didn't want to have children, but they seemed pretty happy without children. Um, they were the only presidential couple who didn't have any children either of their own or adopted. So the other childless presidents adopted children. And Sarah and James never did. They had the opportunity to adopt children and they didn't do it. So, and also neither of them ever said anything about being sad about not having children and nobody in their family said anything about them being sad about not, being, not having children. So I kind of conclude from this that they were just happy as a unit of two. All right, to wrap up here, um, Sarah is this kind of, remarkable political figure, um, definitely the most powerful female in terms of politics of her era. 
Uh, and yet no one knows much about her. And now why, why has Sarah's contribution to the politics of first ladies been so overlooked? And there's a few reasons here. First of all, there, we have very little of, of Sarah's correspondence left. So her, in contrast to other first ladies who left voluminous amounts of papers, most of Sarah's correspondence is missing. It's gone. So it was a struggle to amass enough research to write this book. Uh, I spent about two years just gathering all the material, um, letters by and to her and about her in order to put this book together. Um, it, my book on Sarah is the first uh, real biography that has been written about her. Uh, so people just don't know much about her because she didn't leave a lot of paper. The second reason is that Sarah tried really hard to fly under the radar. She didn't want people to know how powerful she was. She always downplayed her own political skills. Um, one of her friends said she was better informed than it was her disposition to make known. She early learned to be silent when anything was at stake. She never told more than she knew, and she seldom made an effort to display what she said as wisdom. So this is what I mean about her claiming that her views are her husband's, always saying Mr. Polk thinks this or Mr. Polk thinks that when conferring with uh, James's associates. Um, and although she was, quote, familiar with the great matters exercising the main minds of public men, um, she had what contemporaries called intuitive tact. Quote, she was too delicate and reserved to proclaim political opinions or to join in the discussion of party differences. Being so intelligent and so well-informed yet so unobtrusive, she was a charming companion. So in other words, the reason we don't know about how political Sarah Polk was is that she was really good at what she did. Um, the other reason I think why we don't know about Sarah Polk, well, there's two more reasons. One, she came to power at the same time as the early women's rights movement. So in comparison to radicals like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, um, Sarah kind of appeared to be a conservative model. So she looked like the non-political figure in opposition to women who were pushing for women's rights. And this was an image she cultivated. So she was sort of the anti-radical, a woman who hid her powers behind her subservience to her husband. Newspapers described her as, quote, in the highest sense of lady and a model for every woman to imitate. And even in the remarkable approving words of one paper, quote, a sweet exemplification of lowliness. I think that's a pretty sad term. And then finally, I'll say the last reason why we don't know about Sarah Polk is that the presidency and particularly war are very heavily gendered. Um, and they're gendered masculine. And we, we all understand this on one level. Why does there continue to be hostility to the idea of female soldiers in combat positions? Because war is the territory of men. How, be, how has it come to be that the US still hasn't elected a woman president, despite the fact that Germany, England, India, and even Pakistan have had female chief executives? Because some segment of the population continues to believe that the commander in chief should be a man. Now, if that's true now, what must it have been like in the 1840s? So in the 1840s, I can tell you, political power and war were not things that women were supposed to participate in. Um, so Sarah managed to ex manage the trick of excelling in the male sphere of politics without seeming to threaten anyone. This was because, in one, as one approving commentator put it, she lived behind her husband as a politician. In an era of increasing agitation for women's rights, Mrs. Polk cultivated a persona of subservience that powerful men felt found intoxicating. She was a woman who venerated the work of men and excelled at it in large part because she politically embraced an almost reactionary standard of female subservience. And by brilliantly manipulating the gender codes of the day, she became one of the most powerful first ladies in history. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Amy. We have many questions and there's much discussion. So I've curated a few here for you. One of the questions that came up um, was related to Sarah Polk and slavery. So you talked a little bit about um, her position of being childless and having that advantage um, to allow her to do work. I wonder what her role as a slave owner um, was in relation to that. How did that impact her ability? The story of the Polks is totally a story about slavery. Slave labor financed everything that they did. Um, James bought, he first bought a plantation in Tennessee before he became president. And then right before he became president, he bought a, tennis, a, a plantation in Mississippi where 50 to 60 men and women and children worked under the most atrocious conditions possible, growing cotton where there was um, a lower life expectancy than almost anywhere else in the country except um, the sugar producing region of Louisiana. So really a, a death camp. They basically ran a death camp and that provided the money for him to run his political campaigns. So apart from the fact that their world, their political world would not have been financially possible had people not been working and dying to make the money that they spent on their political campaigns, Sarah was only able to focus on politics because she had household enslaved people who were doing her work. And there's some really uh, kind of remarkable anecdotes um, in this book. I don't know how many of you know who Senator Thomas Hart Benton was, but he was the most powerful Washington, uh, most powerful Western Senator. He was a Senator from Missouri. He was one of the most powerful Democrats in Washington, DC in the decades before the Civil War. And he came to dinner at the White House and the hour for when dinner was supposed to be served came and went. And Sarah was just talking to people. And he said to her, um, you know, wasn't dinner supposed to be served? And she said, oh, you know, uh, Senator Benton, don't you know that the cook sets the hour for dinner? So she just allowed, she what? She took all of the work that really should have been her responsibility. And she just not only made enslaved people do it, but she just ignored it altogether. She just totally ignored it. So she lived in such a rarefied atmosphere that um, everything she did was only enabled because enslaved people were doing the work. And if I can just say one more thing about slavery, one of the kind of remarks, I only really focused on Sarah as first lady here because um, this is this wonderful venue that we're at, but the, my biography of Sarah Polk, you know, half of her life was spent, she spent half of her life after she left the White House um, and almost all of that with the exception of three months, she was a widow. And when James died three months after leaving office, she became the mistress of that cotton plantation in Mississippi and she ran it herself and she made a lot of money and a lot of people died um, under her management um, of the plantation. So Sarah's story is very much a, a story of slavery. There's a question here, and it's an issue we talk about a lot of National First Ladies Library about the um, hostesses. So the women who were not First Ladies who might have assisted the First Lady or filled in when a First Lady was ill or unavailable. Um, so there's a question about Polk's nieces and um, the reaction to them. So when they return calls, were there complaints who um, from those who expected to be called on by a first lady? I'm so glad. Thank you, whoever asked this question. Yes, yes, people were horrified. They were horrified, but this is where Dolly Madison really came to Sarah's um, aid. So the hostesses of Washington, D.C., who were very powerful women, they were not okay with Polk's nieces returning these calls and they, but Dolly Madison stuck up for Sarah and she said, look, 
Um, in our day, talking about 20, 30 years before, Washington was a much smaller place. And it's just too big now for women to return calls the way that they used to. And Sarah is a lovely lady and we need to give her the benefit of the doubt. So I think had it not been for having Dolly Madison's support, um, there would have been a mass movement against Sarah, uh, which is, you know, something that happened um, to in the Monroe administration. Uh, Monroe's, Monroe's wife uh, was really not interested in opening up the White House to parties, and there was a major reaction against her as First Lady, but this didn't happen, it didn't happen to Sarah because Dolly Madison called the shots and Dolly and Sarah were very, very close friends. Can you talk a bit about the paper trail for writing this book? One of the things that really fascinated me was the way that the um, that her husband would say, can you send this pamphlet or speech to someone? Um, and I kept thinking about like the way these pieces of paper or pamphlets were crossing um, from one place to another. Were you following them, trying to track them down? Um, it just seemed like there was a lot going on, that there was a lot of mail. And I'm sure that's happening with a lot of presidents, but to see it happen with the first lady through correspondence was really interesting. Um, okay, so a couple things about this. In the 19th century before the Civil War, the main interaction that people had with the federal government was through the post office. There were many, many more post offices in the 19th century than there are now. And um, mail was this really, really important thing. And Congress, everybody in Washington who was an elected official, they had, um, what you would call franking rights. So they were able to send political mail for free. So uh, this was like a, a huge deal. So there's a ton of political correspondence that's going back and forth um, because there's, it, this, was a fun, this was a fun book to research. This was my fifth book. And um, I knew it was gonna be a challenge to research it, but I felt up to the challenge um, when I, so when I was researching my book on the US-Mexico war, that was when I first learned about Sarah Polk because I would read letters between politicians and they would say, uh, oh, spoke to Mrs. Polk. She says this or that. And I said, who is this Mrs. Polk that, you know, what is she doing? It's, this is just James K. Polk's wife. How great could she be? Um, I know James is very traditional. She can't be that great. So, um, and then I found there wasn't much written about her. So that was why I decided to write this book. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of fun following the paper trail and seeing, okay, who is, who does James want Sarah to send stuff to? Does that person correspond with James about Sarah? Uh, and sometimes they did. So it was, it was really a sleuthing act. Um, and there's a scholar named David Hankin who wrote a book called City Reading that talks about the importance of writing. Um, generally in this time period, if you were to walk through a city in the 1840s, the walls of buildings would just be papered with signs um, and posters. And so Americans are very visual people in this time period and um, written culture is just, it's very, it's just crucial in a way that it isn't in a later period. There is a great image in the book of an um, image Sarah Polk copies of Hail to the Chief um, when she's in school. And one of the things that we often discuss related to first ladies was who was the first to do this and that. Um, and there's an interesting discussion in the chat about the song Hail to the Chief and Sarah Polk's role in making that um, so important to the presidency. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, hail to the chief. Um, so James was not very tall. He was maybe five, seven. And he was very slender. He was a small, small man made smaller by the fact that he was, he just didn't eat very well. So he was always skinny. He was never in good health. Um, and so Sarah started during the US-Mexico war. 
started having the band play Hail to the Chief when he would walk into a reception as a way to get people to notice him. But, you know, right, as Allison points out, she loved that. Like when she was back um, at school, she copied out the music to Hail to the Chief. So she, she really liked the piece of music. But so she was the first lady to, to play that um, in the White House. And uh, and it was because she wanted people to notice James. So there's another question and discussion. We just had Elaine Weiss speak at the National First Ladies Library. We were wrapping up our suffrage centennial celebration and thinking about Sarah Polk in relationship to women's suffrage and women's rights, which she had very little use for. And one of the people asking questions was like, I have a really hard time kind of dealing with this and looking at it as a con in the 21st century. Can you talk about Sarah Polk's relationship with suffrage and women's rights? Um, did she just have not have a need for it because of I, her- I, I would love to talk about this. So, you know, if you want to be uncharitable, which there's plenty of reason to be uncharitable, you would say, Sarah had no interest in other women getting the rights that she had. She had all the rights that she needed because she was rich, she was white, she was married to a man that thought she was equal, she had slaves to finance her life and to do all her work for her, um, and she was well-educated. So she was able to do everything that she wanted to. She had no need for any rights. She had them all and she didn't want anybody else to have them. That would be one way to look at it. That's the least charitable interpretation you could put on it. And I would say there's at least a 50% chance that's true. Now, to be more fair to her, I would say, and this is why I was talking about her religious perspective. If you are an old school Presbyterian like Sarah is, you believe that hierarchy is pre destined, right? That hierarchy is right, that God made things that way. This is really her belief. So she, at one point, she and James are hanging out in the White House. It's a sweltering hot summer day. And there are enslaved men working in the garden outside. And she says to James, James, um, look at those men out there. Um, who are working in the hot sun and you and I are sitting in here um, in the, it wasn't of course cool by our standards, but for them cool compared to being outside. Um, this, is, this is God's will. God made things this way. They intended things to be this way. And James is actually kind of like astounded by this. He's like, oh, okay, you know, if you say so, but he would repeat that story to show that she really, she's a true believer in this. So she thinks God intended women to be below men. I really think she believes this, but at the same time, she thinks there are exceptions. And she's an exception, and some of her friends are exceptions, but that this is this is the way things are. So I think if you look at it as um, a, a, an unfortunate political belief that's an outgrowth of her religious worldview, um, that would be a more charitable way to look at it. I, I actually came to the kind of concluded by the end of my research that, uh, so James and Sarah, if you wanna do a whole perspective of how conservative your beliefs could be about race and gender to how liberal they could be about race and gender, they're both very, very close to the how conservative as you can be. But I think James was a little bit more liberal than Sarah. And the reason I think this is that, um, when one of James's sisters was widowed, he really pushed her to protect her own property rights and make sure that the kids didn't get control of it. And he he wrote well, and he actually was was pretty to to the women that he cared about in his life. His views, I would say, um, were more in line with women's rights certainly than anything Sarah ever wrote. Thank you for answering that so succinctly. Um, Last question for you today, because I know we have kept you for a long time. Um, can you tell us what you're working on now? What are you researching? Yeah, um, right now I am working on a book about the election of 1856, which is 
an election that people don't know. I see, I like things that people don't know that much about. Wrote a book about a war, the US-Mexico war people don't know about, and then a first lady no one knows about, and then now an election no one knows about. So we all know about the election of 1860 because that's the election where Abraham Lincoln um, becomes president and then there's the civil war. But the election of 1856 is fascinating because we have um, a candidate, Millard Fillmore, who is an open, nativist. He's a xenophobe and he runs on what's called the American party, which is the only time that a major party that was explicitly xenophobic has run a presidential candidate. It's also the first election the Republican party runs a candidate for, and that is John C. Fremont. And John C. Fremont's wife is a woman named Jessie Benton Fremont, who is an incredibly powerful woman as well. Uh, and then the guy that wins is James Buchanan, um, who is a very, very sad figure, but also a Pennsylvanian and I know a lot about. So I'm writing about writing about that election and exploring female political power. Um, the Republican Party ran on a campaign that was like our Jesse and talking about how great Jesse Benton was. And, and then, of course, we all know that when Buchanan becomes president, he has Harriet Lane serve as his first lady. And that's when the term first lady is first used. So it's a fun, it's a fun project. Are there any other first ladies that you feel like are overlooked that deserve, uh, who's, who's the next first lady that someone should be writing a biography about? Oh, that's a good question. Um, We could use more work on Bess Truman. She's fascinating. Um, and from the period that I study, um, somebody just completed a wonderful dissertation about Rachel Jackson. Now, Rachel, um, Andrew Jackson's wife, she actually died before um, Jackson got to the White House, but she was a really important uh, figure overall. I see somebody just wrote Pat Nixon. Isn't that the truth? Pat Nixon's fantastic too. Uh, but you know, I, I am in favor of having some more work done on the on the lesser known ladies. From the from the 19th century, whenever I talk at a um, symposium about first ladies, it's always like all the wonderful 20th century women that we know. Um, and then me. But I'm I'm so pleased to be able to talk to you all and um, and I hope that you read the book and you enjoy it. Well, this has been an exciting discussion. I have never seen more um, questions in the Q&A. So I have really enjoyed this discussion, Amy Greenberg, and I hope that everyone will join us on the 22nd for our book discussion. So if you haven't, pick up a copy of Lady First from your local library or local bookshop and meet up with us then. So thank you so much, Amy Greenberg. It was wonderful to finally connect up with you and hear about Sarah Polk. And we look forward to seeing you all next time. Have a great rest of your day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.